and welcome to week four of our study, The Holy Spirit, a 10-week study on the third person of the Trinity. My name is Melanie Rayner, and I'm the ministry director at the Cool Springs location of Christ Presbyterian Church. In the last few weeks, we've looked together at who the Holy Spirit is, His role as creator, and His role as our guide. Today, we're going to look at the Holy Spirit's role as judge, the one who convicts us of our sin. Judging is a complicated idea, both in our spiritual lives and in our culture. The word judge has so many connotations. We judge what is good and right, what is wrong. We judge others for making choices that we wouldn't. We serve on juries, judging those in our community who have wronged others. We judge referees while watching football and Instagram influencers and our neighbors for their garish Halloween decorations. Judging comes from a sense of knowing or believing that there are right ways and wrong ways to do things. And yet we live in a culture that as it becomes increasingly postmodern, tells us that any sort of judgment is wrong, that truth is subjective, and that we should just mind our own business. Where we'll land today is understanding that the role of the Holy Spirit as judge is not only something to be afraid of, but something that we should long for, something that we should pray for. So I'm excited to go on this journey together as we uncover why it's a good thing that the Holy Spirit is our judge and why we should want more of his convicting power in our lives. When I was in college, I was a competitive public speaker and debater. I spent my weekends in college going to competitions for fun to get judged on how quickly and successfully I could construct a 10 minute speech about any topic they would throw at me, or how persuasively I could argue a point against an opponent whose name I would probably never know. I loved it. I loved being judged. I loved being challenged, being told how I could get better. Some of my favorite memories from college are pouring over ballots with my friends and debate partners over a mama's pancake breakfast at any given Cracker Barrel in the country. I think I liked being judged for the same reasons I loved getting graded on projects and papers in school. I was good at it. And I loved the challenge to get better. But when it comes to thinking through things like today's passages, to understanding the role of the Holy Spirit as a judge in my life, I bristle. It's uncomfortable. It's one thing to be judged as a way to improve in something competitive where you can win. It's another thing to be judged for your sin nature, all the ways you wish you were better but just can't seem to be, and to see through conviction the ways that you hurt others. And yet it's a crucible of our faith, a requirement to see with clear eyes just how sinful we are. And this is one of the key roles the Holy Spirit plays in our faith. He is the judge. Today we'll spend most of our time together in John 16. In your study book, there's a passage from Judges that shows how the Holy Spirit played this role in the Old Testament. And I definitely encourage you to spend time in that passage and discussing it in your groups. But to give you a roadmap for today's teaching, we'll start by looking at Jesus' statements in John 16 about the Holy Spirit. And then we'll spend a few minutes understanding how the Holy Spirit's convicting role fits with the Father and the Son in the Trinitarian act of salvation. And because I'll, I'll give you the end game here at the beginning, the Holy Spirit's role as convictor and judge cannot possibly be understood without seeing it in context with the redeeming sacrifice of Jesus and the restoration of right relationship with the Father. It is a beautiful thing. And this is one of those areas where it can be really uh, tempting to divide the Trinity. And one of the things that we're, we're trying to communicate through this study is you can make distinctions about the roles of the Trinity, but they cannot be divided. And yes, that is very, confusing. And it's okay to not understand or be able to articulate every nuance of that. Just a friendly reminder. So let's start in John 16 with a little bit of context. Jesus is speaking to his disciples here in what is known as the upper room discourse. This occurs in John chapters 14 through 17. It is happening at the Last Supper, right before Jesus is betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane by Judas and is put on trial 
crucified and buried before he, he rises again. So Jesus knows that all of this is about to happen. And his disciples are figuring it out. They're learning more as the evening progresses. So much happens here. It would be worth your time to read through the whole discourse to see everything that Jesus communicates to his disciples in these last hours. There's so much friendship, so much love and service throughout. But Jesus also threads the hope of the Holy Spirit throughout, beginning in chapter 14. As Jesus is saying goodbye to his disciples, he is communicating all of these most important things to these men who will carry his message to the world. And he shows them over and over again that the Spirit will be there with them. In 1416, he says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. In 1426, Jesus says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. In 1526 and 27, Jesus says, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. So the disciples know that the Spirit is coming, the Spirit who breathed life and guided God's people from the very beginning. He will be their guide, their strength, their helper. And then in chapter 16, Jesus reveals a different facet of the Spirit's role, a critical one. He's not just their friend and their helper. He will convict them and the world of its sin and unrighteousness. Because Jesus is about to go to the cross to pay the price for the world's sin and brokenness, he speaks about it with authority and clarity. Sin matters, he's saying. It matters so much that he's going to die for it, that his love is greater than all the brokenness that sin has caused. As the old hymn, The Wonders Cross says, the cross is where sorrow and love flow mingled down. So Jesus is communicating this, the sorrow and the love, the sin and the restoration, the conviction and the mercy. We see in this discourse, in the promise of the Holy Spirit, a picture of the mystery of how the Trinity works in perfect harmony. The Spirit convicts, the Son saves, the Father restores. The Father chooses us for salvation, the Son redeems us, and the Spirit applies that salvation to us. We'll get to that more in another week. In John 16, Jesus says this, explaining the Spirit's role in our salvation. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the father has is mine, And therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Do you see what's happening here? The Spirit will convict you concerning sin. Then he will guide you to the truth, the truth about Jesus. And then the Spirit will take what is Jesus's, his righteousness, and declare it to you. It's helpful to see how it all works together, how in unity the Trinity provides everything we need for salvation, but to also spend some time calling out the role of the Holy Spirit as the one who convicts. I'm going to guess that we've all had some experience of knowing that we're doing the wrong thing, of our role in breaking a relationship, of our complicity in a systemic or ongoing pattern of sin, that still small voice that we've always been told will guide us. That's the Spirit. Charles Spurgeon called it the withering work of the Spirit. And I love that phrase. It's so powerful. Spurgeon said, There is a withering work of the Spirit of God which we must experience, or we shall never know 
his quickening and restoring power. The withering is a most needful experience and just now needs much to be insisted on. Today, we have so many built up who were never pulled down, so many filled who were never emptied, so many exalted who were never humbled, that I the more earnestly remind you that the Holy Ghost must convince us of our sin or we cannot be saved. Here's where I want to camp out for just a second. The Holy Spirit convicts us, but that's not all. As Spurgeon says, without conviction, we cannot be saved. Without knowing how sinful we are, we do not need to repent and turn to Jesus. The Spirit shows us by judging us, by illuminating our sin, just how far we are from God and just how much we need Jesus. Here's the good news. We are not convicted in a vacuum. This is not like the ballots that I received in debate judging, telling me all the ways that I could do better, be better, think better, and win better. This is the good news that comes within the Trinitarian work of salvation. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin and, as we'll talk about more in a couple weeks, applies our salvation to us, sealing us for our future hope with God. What I'm trying to do here is to convince you that it is not only a palatable thing that the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin, but that it is good and necessary, that we should seek his conviction in our lives and hearts, that there is a connection between the conviction of the Holy Spirit and our growth in Christ-likeness, that he not only shows us all the ways that we are living outside of the rightly ordered design of God, but that he fills our hearts with a desire to live more in the way of Christ. Jeffrey Greenman wrote in his book, Life in the Spirit, that spiritual formation is our continuing response to the reality of God's grace, shaping us into the likeness of Jesus Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit in the community of faith for the sake of the world. So as our final application for this week, I'm gonna say a hard thing, and it's a thing that I need to hear as much as I bristle at it. We should pray that the Holy Spirit would convict us continually of our sin. Why? Because it will draw us nearer to Jesus. It will remind us that we cannot fix or earn our way out of this hole that we're in because of our sin. It will remind us that Jesus paid it all and it will bring us into deeper fellowship with him. So I'm gonna close today by reading Psalm 25 as a prayer. And I'd love for you to close your eyes and pray with me. This Psalm asks for that convicting and guiding work of the Lord through the Holy Spirit. And it is a Psalm that you and I can return to day after day to pray that the Holy Spirit will guide us will convict us of the sin in our hearts. And that that conviction will come not with sentencing or guilt, but with the free righteousness of Jesus. Pray with me. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me known to your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way he should choose. 
His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him, and he makes known to them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all of his troubles. Amen.